This is Modern Persian Food, a culinary podcast for today's food enthusiasts. We talk about classic Persian flavors, modern recipes, and embracing culture and identity through food. I'm Bita. And I'm also Bita. Welcome to our show. Hi, everyone. We're going to be Spice Girls today in episode 93. We're bringing back a fan favorite, our second ever episode. And we're going to share with you aromatic spices. This is a full episode. It is robust. We cover some of the iconic royal spices and flavors that makes Persian food so unique. We even go into herbs and some floral essences. And I really like this episode too. And it's fun to hear what we sounded like when we were more fresh and new. And I'm joined as always by the other Bita June. Hi, Bita. Hi there, Bita June. Hello, everyone. We hope that you enjoy this episode. This is the second one of our four-part series this summer. We're trying something a little bit different while we work behind the scenes to bring you guys some fresh content in the fall with some fun guests and some fresh new topics to talk about. And we wanted to just take the opportunity to share some of the fan favorites, as Bita June said, some of our most popular episodes, and just wanted to share the content in case you hadn't had a chance to listen to it. So that's what we're doing this summer for the month of July. And with that, enjoy this next episode. So today, we're so excited to talk about spices. It's the foundation of what makes Persian food unique. It sets us apart. The aromatic smells and tastes of saffron, turmeric, cinnamon, and more. And Bita and I just want to share today with you what we feel are some of the pantry staples in Persian cooking, and maybe just share what our favorite spices are, how we use them in our dishes in our homes today. Yeah, what do you think, Bita? What do you think are some of the most commonly used Persian spices in Persian cuisine? I think one of the most common spices in Persian food, and I use a lot of it at home too, is turmeric. I would say turmeric is pretty much like a staple in all of Persian cooking. And it's actually so good for you too. I actually make like a little turmeric elixir in the morning and have that first off to get myself ready for the day. But turmeric is great. Really just add it to almost every ingredient, pretty much at the beginning stages of a recipe after frying some onions or, you know, as the base, we'll add the turmeric and bloom it a little bit in the hot oil. I would say turmeric is probably the spice that I use the most in my Persian cooking. Your favorite spice, though, is the spice that is acclaimed and coveted in all of Persian cooking, saffron. Why don't you talk a little bit about saffron? Yeah, I'd love to talk about saffron. So saffron is probably most commonly used on rice, and it comes in many forms. The way that I use it is I like to use it on chicken and meats. Saffron, it's it's super expensive. It's like the king of spices. It's unique. It's hard to get. And the reason that it's expensive and exquisite is that it's actually it's just the inside of a flower, kind of like those strands that are in the inside of a flower. Mm-hmm. And to collect enough of them takes quite a few, as you can imagine, flowers. And then they come in sort of like a dried form, which to get it to be how it's traditionally used... What I do is I grind it with the back of a spoon on a hard bowl to Uh get it in a powder form. Like a mortar and pestle. Exactly. I don't have one. (laughs) And so I just use a spoon in a bowl and then I boil water. So for about a quarter teaspoon of ground saffron, I would use about two tablespoons of boiling water to get a beautiful yellow. It's fragrant. It makes it colorful. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how it's traditionally used is to pour it on top of your rice or into your stew to get those aromatic flavors. And to me, the smell, right? Smell and taste are really similar sensations to me. And so when we say aromatic, that's what I'm talking about. And you can smell it. And so when you said that you like to put turmeric in your onions, uh-huh. I bet the smell is just out of control. Yep. Have you ever tried saffron in, for example, like scrambled eggs? No, not in scrambled eggs. What I do like putting it on sometimes is if I'm like roasting shrimp, 
I love like roasting shrimp as a easy way mm. to cook it. And then I toss mm-hmm. it with saffron, bloomed saffron. And it just really makes a very unique and kind of exotic flavor. And to your point about grinding up the saffron, another way to do it if you don't use like a mortar or pestle or the spoon technique that you talked about is actually in a coffee grinder. I know like at my mom's house, she has it. I don't have a designated one, but she has like a designated coffee grinder that's just for saffron. And the stigmas that you were talking about, the inside of the saffron flower, they're actually like really beautiful purple flowers. I didn't realize that they were actually purple, the flowers themselves, and then the strands inside are red. They look like little hairs and then they, they take those out and they dry them. And so when you actually buy it, they come in like these little containers, sometimes in little glass containers. I know in Iran, they have like these little flat, sometimes look like Petri dish type things and they're packaged and then sold that way. But yeah, using a coffee grinder is another way to really get a fine grind on them to use and then to bloom it in the hot water like you were talking about and basically like brew it. If you don't bloom it, then it just kind of it doesn't express all of the color and flavor. Yeah, all good points. I love saffron on seafood. I do. You brought that up with the shrimp. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I like it on salmon. I mentioned yes. that in the first episode. Also on any meat, chicken. I have a recipe that is an old family recipe. My grandma's um, chicken and carrots, it's kind of evolved into being something else. But I think that everyone sort of has a saffron chicken recipe in their family. Yeah. But when I was new to cooking Persian food, I didn't know about that technique of dissolving it in water and I would just kind of throw the dried strands Uh on top and I mean it it does work it just doesn't it's a very potent spice so even if you throw it on top it's gonna give it the flavor and the color it's just not gonna spread as nicely when it's dissolved it can spread and then you just it gives it a beautiful color that you can flip up with the fork Mm -hmm. yeah so saffron is definitely my favorite spice I just want spices to be fresh. I think that if they're fresh, then they're better. And that's just yeah. me kind of evolving as a home chef in understanding that, yeah, you got to go through your spices. And if they're old, toss them. Yeah, that's a good point. Because in the past, relatives that would come from Iran would bring saffron. They'd bring pistachios yeah. and they'd bring saffron because the one from Iran is supposed to be the superior one. And I would keep it in the freezer. Yeah, that's actually the best place to keep it is in the freezer. I'll grind it up and then I have it like in a little jar in my spice cabinet. But I probably should keep that in the freezer too. Mm -hmm. Just because it is, you're right, it is just so nice when it's nice and fresh and lovely. I have a really pretty spice grinder that's from Turkey. And it's more ornamental than functional. But the spice market there is something Uh I will never forget. I went to the Grand Bazaar in Turkey and in Istanbul and the spice market, which was so fun and beautiful. But I don't have memories. I was young when we immigrated here of the markets and spice markets. But I could imagine that they were really similar to that. Yeah. You know, so I've been to Iran a handful of times growing up and the bazaars that they have the spices in, it's really interesting because it's very different from any type of like kind of spice, you know, it's very different than going to the grocery store here and seeing like just like a shelf of a bunch of different bottles. There, there's these big gunny sack type of containers that are full of whatever it is, spice, black pepper, turmeric and all these different dried berries and dried seeds all in these big kind of like a foot and a half diameter wide sacks that they have it on it's all so colorful and they have like nabot which is like rock sugar with saffron in that too actually one of the things that is really beautiful there is the advie it has layers and layers of different spices because Advia, this mix, basically, it's like a customized mix of different spices. It has the different layers and then they kind of scoop it down so it gets a little bit of each of the different spices in there. That is really cool. Yeah, it looks really beautiful. It reminds me of the sand art we used to do as a kid. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) And cardamom is a big one, too. Very Persian. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's one that's in tea. Yes. Yeah. So cardamom is so beautiful. The little pods and inside of the little pods, the small little cardamom seeds. And you can either leave it whole or you can grind that up, too, right? Yes, absolutely. And so when you brew tea, we'll have an episode just on tea (laughs) and how to make tea. 
But yeah, you could have that seep with the tea and brew and it adds to such a lovely, delicate flavor. The orange blossom is delicious with cardamom. I have put it in oatmeal. Talk about modern ways. So I make mm. oatmeal in my pressure cooker and you can make it in an instant pot enough uh-huh. for the week. So you can even make oatmeal in a rice cooker, but to put like little essences of cardamom and, you know, orange in there, it just makes it really interesting and different. Yeah, yeah. That reminds me of, you know, halim. Mm, mm-hmm. Halim is like a type of oatmeal. I actually make a version and actually call it porridge. Basically, like slow cooking the oatmeal and adding broth. And usually they make it either with turkey or with, I'll make it with like chicken. I'll even use like rotisserie chicken, honestly, and like shred it up and put it in there. And then sometimes use a hand blender to just smooth it out after I've cooked the oatmeal. The traditional way that they serve that is they'll let it cook overnight in like Iran. They'll let it cook overnight. And then in the mornings you go with your own little pot to the place that sells the halim and they fill your pot up and then they weigh it and then you pay for it. But the way that I like to make it is I'll just cook the oatmeal with the broth and the shredded meat. And to serve it, the traditional way to serve it is actually put melted butter, cinnamon, and sugar on top of it, which is pretty like decadent for like a morning thing, but it's a very cozy, comforting type of meal. And actually, like when my kids were little, like they would eat that and like I would be very happy because it has like oats and it has protein and and we'll add a little cinnamon. So cinnamon is something that's definitely a part of that dish. But cinnamon in general, to your point, like I love adding a little bit of cinnamon to even when I make ashirishte, which is the Persian noodle, the hearty soup with all the beans and the greens and noodles. I'll put a little bit of cinnamon in it and it's just like a little bit of a like a je ne sais quoi, of like what is that flavor? And it's just like it's a little bit of cinnamon. I've started to like actually add a little bit of cinnamon to a lot of different recipes. It's just like if I'm adding a bunch of spices, I'll just put a little bit of cinnamon in there. And it's not a very strong cinnamon flavor. You can't actually even discern that it's cinnamon, but there is just something that's like a little bit more warming to it. It makes it taste really delicious. Oh my goodness, yes. I'm obsessed with cinnamon. So in addition to being a food blogger, I'm also a family nutritionist. In my coaching practice, I preach cinnamon in everything because it has that sweet flavor without needing to add added sugar. So yeah, I love it in Persian food and I grew up eating it in Persian food, but we also put it in just about everything because of that adding the sweetness without adding sugar. So it's a beautiful spice and it's really versatile in both savory and sweet. Yeah. Oh, we should totally talk about sumac. Oh, yes, we totally should talk about sumac. (laughs) Somar, if you want the Persian way to say it, somar. I think of somar like the main way that I think we all eat somar is on top of kebabs. Mm -hmm. So sumac is actually the dried sumac berry. It's dried and ground up, and it's a lemony, tart, brown-colored, basically condiment that we add to food. And the traditional way is on top of kebabs, but there's so many new ways to use sumac. I mean, I feel like sprinkling it on salads or like cucumbers or tomatoes or yogurt. Those are all like really fun ways to kind of add flavor, a tartness and a real Persian flavor to sometimes not even Persian dishes. Samar, how did I do? Yeah, you did great. Oh, good. Samar. Yeah. So what I associate Samar with is kebab Uh and restaurants. So when you go to a Persian restaurant, you probably will see a big glass receptacle shaker for Samar. And when the food comes, it's like, pass the Samar. Somebody pass the Samar. And you put it on, like you said, that sour flavor is really good on meat, Mm -hmm. kebab. And then my family likes it on rice. They put it all over their rice. And when we're home these days, if we get takeout from a Persian restaurant, they will often have little packets. Yeah, I love that. You know, we we do have it at home. So if we are barbecuing, even if we're making, I don't know, carne asada, it doesn't have to be Persian food. My family will still use samar and then put it kind of on everything. And it gives it to us sort of like a restaurant feel like we're out. Yeah. It's delicious. I'm starting to see it all over too. Different recipes and roasted vegetables and have a little bit of somog afterwards, like as a seasoning, yeah. like salt. 
One way that I don't want to forget is mint. Yeah. We're going to have, I think, an, a whole episode about fresh herbs because it's such a big part of our cuisine. Mm-hmm. But I'm talking about dried mint. I really like using dried mint. Again, when I'm sauteing onions, it creates this crunchy, delicious, aromatic, almost like a topping mm-hmm. to use on ashrashte. That's where yeah. we use it. And some badam jan. Ashrashte is a traditional soup with noodles and vegetables and beans. And you put this oniony spiced mint topping turmeric and everything on it and yogurt and Uh the same with some of our eggplant appetizers is to put that onion mint combination is like no other do you you use it do you use dried mint yeah I love dried mint and I actually use a lot of dried dill too and I'll mix that into yogurt sometimes either one of them really with just plain yogurt or yogurt with like cucumber for like masajiyar and I'll mix it up and it adds just such a beautiful depth of flavor when you add the dried herbs into it. Definitely on top of ashirishte, I also add it to my kuku recipe when I'm doing it. Even with like the fresh ingredients, I'll put dried mint and dried dill in there too. And that again, just adds like so much flavor to it. Those are definitely pantry staples. Don't forget limu amoni. That's dried lime. Yeah. Dried lime is so interesting. When I talk about the sours in the stews and the Persian cuisine, that's what I'm talking about. And if, if I don't have it, I'll substitute lemon juice. Uh-huh. But it's not quite the same. Limu amoni, the dried limes are so sour and they can be used in different ways. Tell me how you use them. Yeah, so limu amoni it actually is lime from like a certain region called Oman. So limu means lemon, but then there isn't also like a really a differentiating term for lime in Farsi. I think it's a dried lemon from Oman area. And so when you get it, it's like this hard, ugly, (laughs) brown, dried (laughs) lemon. It's really ugly. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, what is that? You're going to cook with that? So you have to rehydrate it first. And you do that with the traditional way is that like poke with a fork little holes into the limu and put it in your stew like that. Or you can rehydrate it in hot water. You could cook it and simmer it until it rehydrates and it becomes part of the stew. And it stays generally in that same shape. And so when you're eating, some people love it. Some people don't love it. In the stews, you actually get the limu and then you kind of like break it up with your spoon and have a little bit of it like with every bite. Another way you can use it is that actually if it's ground up, you can get it like ground up too. And that's a much easier way to do it. And it's a more subtle way. So like I'll use limu amani in my khoresh karafs, which is my celery and mint parsley stew. It just adds like a little bit of like sourness to it, which I really love. And again, the like tartness of that, you can also use that like on roasted vegetables or yogurt to like ump the sourness factor. One of my favorite Persian stews is khoresh gheme. And excuse my uh, French, excuse my bad Farsi accent, no. which sounds like a toddler with a Midwestern accent speaking Not Farsi. At all. <laughs> I don't think so. Anyway, Horesha Kaime is Farsi for yellow split pea stew, which doesn't mm-hmm. sound super appetizing, but it's the Persian yellow split pea pea stew with french fries on top and kind of has like a tomato base yeah and we use limu amani the dried lemon inside and we keep it in there and i like that dish really sour it's so delicious yeah they gotta make some tonight (laughs) that sounds great it's also traditional to use limu amani in gorma sabzi yeah which is the stew it has like all the herbs in it (laughs) it has like every herb chopped up in it you fry the herbs it takes all day I actually have never made it myself and I don't think I will ever make it because it is just so labor intensive I'm glad you said that I've never made it either but my husband loves it it's the one with the kidney beans yeah it has kidney beans in it and the limo money and it would just take me like a whole weekend to make it But it's great and it smells so delicious and it's like that's the quintessential Persian dish, I think. But the other thing in there, which brings up a good point, fenugreek. I was going to say that. Yeah. I was going to ask you because some people like it and others don't care for it. And since neither you or I actually cook that dish in our homes, I, I don't know whether you use it. We don't so much. I don't actually have it in my house, but it is a very Persian 
flavor. And that's the main flavor that people will either love Gorma Sabzi or hate Gorma Sabzi is because of the fenugreek. But you could also make it without it. Yeah, you could also make it without it. Yeah, definitely. The grandmas in our family make it and we love it and we like eating it and we like it Uh when they cook it for us, but they don't actually put that in it. So I don't remember the Farsi word for it. It's hard. I think it's shambalile. (gasps) Yes, you get points for that. Well, I think that brings us to wrapping up this episode. Yeah. So these are just basic spices that you'll find in Persian cooking. Pretty much like a good overview of some of the main things that we include in our cooking. All right. So be sure to email us hello at modernpersianfood.com with any questions that you have. We'll do our best to include it in the next episode. Wow, there was a lot of great information in Aromatic Spices, our second ever episode. We hope you enjoyed it. One thing that I realized in re-listening is that, you know, it's interesting that there's no big differentiation in the Farsi language for the word lime and lemon. So when we talk about limu amani, we say it's Persian lime, and we also say that it's dried lemon. So just keep that in mind as you're looking for limu amani in your Persian market that it may be referenced as a lemon or it may be also referenced as a lime. But that was some really great information. Hopefully that provided some inspiration for you to seek out those flavors and incorporate it into your kitchen. Thank you all. Until next time. Bye. You've been listening to the Modern Persian Food Podcast with Bita and Bita. Thanks for spending time with us. If you've enjoyed what you heard today, consider telling a friend or giving us a good rating. You can subscribe to our show for free on your favorite podcasting app or find us online at modernpersianfood.com or on Instagram for the recipes and information we talked about today. We'd love to hear your thoughts and see you next time.